Hello, everybody. Here we are now in our second so-called simple linear regression. Now, if you went through the first video, I'm sure by now you agree with me. These are anything but simple. These problems can be long. They can take a lot of time. There's a lot of small little tedious calculations. But with practice, hopefully you'll get into a routine and you'll identify spots where there's common mistakes and you'll know where to kind of pause and slow down and, and double check some of your calculations. And in the first video for the first problem, I told you where there's a couple of little spots where you should be able to double check your work and find if you've made mistakes. So let's jump into this one. I'm going to break this problem down the same way I did for the first problem. We'll, we'll produce a couple of videos, maybe three videos, just to break up the different components and to give you a little bit more of a break between sections. So here we are, we're looking at a, a demand curve. So I've got quantity as a function here of price. So there's my expected quantity as my um, as a function of price. So we have our data. I have my y, oops, my dependent variable. And I have my independent variable. So quantity is somehow a function of or correlated to price the economists that are watching this are certainly aware of the nature of that relationship. So our first step, we're going to fill in the blanks below. So this exercise, you can see your starting point is a little bit different from the starting point that you had in the first problem. Some aspects of this one might be a little bit simpler. Some aspects of this one may be a little bit more complicated, or at least you might have to approach things in a slightly different way. So if we start with regression statistics, because there's not a lot missing there, the regression statistics, all I need is the multiple R and observations. Well, observations is the easiest by far. I can see there I have five observations. Multiple R, well, that's just the square root of the R squared. And there I have my R squared is 0.88. So my multiple R is 0.94. Now again, when you do this in Excel, Excel will always provide a positive value for that multiple R. But that coefficient of correlation, right, that measure of linear association between two variables, well, it can be positive, but it can also be negative. To know whether it's positive or negative, well, we need to know first what is the sign going to be on that slope, on that price coefficient. And we don't know that yet. So for now, we'll leave it as 0.94. Those of you in economics, you know what that relationship is probably going to be if you're familiar with the law of demand. But for the sake of this problem, we'll wait until we have all of that information for us. So there we've got our regression statistics all taken care of. Now, our ANOVA table. So here again, we've got a couple of starting points. But if we understand the relationships between all of these different parts, then filling this in should be relatively straightforward because these relationships between sums of squares, mean squared, f, they're the same as what you went through in module 13. We have the total variation, in our dependent variable, in this case quantity, and we're splitting it up. That which we can explain by our regression, or that we can capture by our, with our chosen independent variables, which here is price and random variation that we do not capture, we do not explain. So where would I begin? Probably a couple of spots. I can fill in degrees of freedom because, again, those never really change. This is always going to be k minus 1, where k is uh, the number of parameters that I'm estimating. And if I come back and I look at my estimated regression equation, I see oh, I'm estimating two parameters, one intercept, one slope. So k is equal to 2. 2 minus 1, of course, is 1. Error, this is n minus k. Again, I have five observations. We're estimating 
two coefficients. And so my degrees of freedom on error, five minus two, I have three total n minus one, or I can just add up the degrees of freedom above n minus one, five minus one is just four. Now, I can hopefully, clearly I can get now my sum of squares regression. Or I could also get my sum of squares, uh, sorry, I could also get my mean squared error. So there's a couple of different paths that I can take, and there's really no right way. There's no way that's necessarily better than another. You can see how I can get my SSR, right? Because I have MSR, which I know is SSR over its degrees of freedom. Well, I already have MSR is 4726, and I also have degrees of freedom. So clearly I can get SSR here uh, as, as a next step. We could also, we also have enough information here. In fact, from the very beginning, we've had enough information here to get MSE. How, you might ask? Well, MSE, you're thinking, Peter, that's SSE divided by its degrees of freedom, and we don't have SSE yet, so how can we get MSE? Well, remember, this standard error of the regression, that's the square root of MSE. So I can use that relationship as well. So again, you know, I'm not saying there's any way here that is better than another, but it's helpful to familiarize yourself with all of these different relationships. So if we get, uh, let's get sum of squares regression first. Sum of squares regression uh, using this relationship here. Well, I know this is just 4726. Now we can see I can get SSE, I can get MSE, right, using this relationship here to get MSE, or I already have SST and SSR. So if I take SST as 54 minus SSR 4726, that gives me 674. 674 divided by its degrees of freedom is 225. And then if we just want to double check, if I take the square root of 225, what do I get? 1.5. So I can use this information to double check, make sure that I'm on the right track, because if, if those numbers don't coincide, then I've made a mistake somewhere. Now we can get our F. Let me just clear this up. Our F statistics for this upper tail F test, MSR over MSE. So 4726 over two and a quarter. 4726 over two and a quarter. That's almost exactly 21. Now remember what this test is, right? This is a test for overall significance of the model. Overall significance. So if I'm thinking broadly, which we'll get to in module 15, right? Where module 15 is beta one is equal to beta two is equal to beta three, on and on and on. They're all equal to zero. Not all are zero. So this is the more general context of an F-test. But in this simple linear regression, it's really a special case of the multiple regression, which we'll get to in 15. Because this simple linear regression, well, I don't have a beta 3, nor do I have a beta 2. So that null hypothesis just becomes beta 1 is equal to 0. The alternative, not all are zero, well, if I only have one of them, I can just simply write it like this. It's not equal to zero. And so this is the F-test for a simple linear regression, and it resembles identically the F-test on that slope coefficient. 
But remember, there's a big difference in methodology here. This is an upper tail F test, just like the module 13 ANOVAs. We have two estimates of variance. We want to determine whether or not one of those, in this context, MSR, is it statistically greater than MSE. This is an upper tail F test. Whereas when we do the T test down here, that test is going to look identical to the F test, except it'll be a two-tail T test, just, just to confuse you and make things more difficult than they already are. Okay, let's get into uh, finishing up our, our test. We can add on here also a critical value. We can do this at 05 degrees of freedom. I have one in the numerator. I have three in the denominator. Our test statistic here is 21. If I come down past these T tables to my F tables, here's one and three. I'm looking at these values here. My critical value is 1013. Oh, way up here. That critical value is 1013. My p-value for a test statistic of 21, my p-value is going to be 0.01 somewhere between 0.01 and 0.025. So I'll write this in below 0.0. Oops. 0.025 greater than 0.01. Good, so we have our ANOVA complete. We have our regression statistics are complete. Now we can move into our third table, which is for the estimated regression equation. Now I'm gonna keep these videos separate just like I did on the first one. So although this was a little bit faster, I'll start a fresh video for those, uh, that third table for estimating that um, regression equation. So what we have so far, what we've learned so far, I have my R squared, 88. This tells me that the price of the product explains 88% of the variation in quantity demanded. Okay, so that's our R squared. It's a measure of goodness of fit, 0.88. It's quite high. Here I have part of that linear uh, correlation. So we still don't know if it's positive or negative. Those of you who have taken some economics and you know the law of demand, you probably could guess what that relationship is going to be. But at least I can see here with a, a correlation coefficient of 0.94, it's going to be quite strong. I don't know yet if it's positive or negative, but it's strong. Here, I also know that the relationship is statistically significant. That price is a valid predictor of quantity demanded. I know that because our conclusion here was to reject the null hypotheses. Our evidence supports the alternative that coefficient is statistically different from zero. If it was zero, right, what would that mean if it was zero? Well, if it was zero, then, you know, there's no relationship. Yeah, But we do have evidence to show that it is statistically different from zero. So our model, which in this case only consists of price, is a valid predictor of quantity demanded. It is correlated with quantity demanded. So we've got all of that. I'll start an another video now and we will get into our coefficients and move on from there. Okay, thanks for watching everybody. Take care.